in Matthew 24, verses 23 to 27, it mm. says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead you astray, if possible, even the elect. How do we know you're not a false prophet like this Bible verse has warned? Well, firstly, I'm not performing great signs. <laughs> so um, I find it interesting sometimes because I'm criticised for not performing great signs, but I'm actually not performing great signs at the moment. And, uh, and I'm still being criticised. <laughs> so <laughs> no matter what you do, people <laughs> criticise you. But um, with regard to this issue of false prophets, certainly that is something I did say, you know, that uh, people would be false with you. And there are many people who are teachers who are false, and there are many people who are saying they're prophets that are false. There are many people currently influenced by spirits, deeply influenced by spirits, and they're all often falsely portraying themselves as, you know, speakers of truth, if you like. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is work out a way to determine who's false and who isn't. But I also said that in the Bible as well. So there's a Bible verse in Matthew 7, that uh, talks about how to determine whether somebody is false and, and what to do if somebody is false. And this is what it says. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognise them. Mm -hmm. So what I was saying uh, then, and I actually did say those words, or similar to those words, was that the only real way that a person can determine whether somebody is a, a, a good person, or a, or a good prophet, if we can call it that, or a person who is deceitful or bad, is by examining their life over a period of time and see how they act and deal with everybody around them and to see what actually happens. Mm -hmm. For a prophet to be true, what he prophesies needs to come true. So if, uh, and there are things that I um, have prophesied in the sense that, uh, that have come true. Um, there are many times when I'm asked questions and I say, oh, I feel that this will happen, but I wouldn't go ahead and prophesy that it would happen uh -huh. because I don't believe I don't, that I know whether that will come true or not. And sure. probably earth change events fit into that category. Yeah. Um, I have a feeling about it, but, but I'm not prophesying about it. To prophesy about something, you have to have a definite feeling that it is something that is true. And at this point in time, everything that I say generally is about my memories and, it's, and so I know they're true yeah. and so that's why I say them as if they are truth because I know that they are. But a false prophet will say things about the future or say things about a teaching mm -hmm. that when you practice it, it turns out not to be true. Simple as that. And, uh, and so that's how you can tell. You can tell by the fruitage of what happens when you follow such a teaching. So my suggestion to people is they don't need to be that afraid of false prophets or people who are deceitful because sooner or later you work out whether they're deceitful or not. A lot of the people who I've uh, dealt with have felt that I'm deceitful after a period of time, mm. interestingly. And one of the reasons why is because eventually they come up against something personally that they ask me a question and I give them a direct answer but it's not an answer that they like. And a lot of people are not very truthful with themselves about answers they don't like. What they do is they blame the deliverer of the information rather than looking at themselves and looking at their response to the information. Mm -hmm. So most people in my life uh, interact with me for a period of time and then when they hear something they do not like, they then accuse me of all sorts of things that before that period of time they didn't feel I did. Yeah. And that's being false with myself, and it's also being false with other people that they tell those things to. And one of the reasons why we are very open now on the internet about what we say and do, 
and why we record almost everything that we say and do with people is because we've had many dealings with people where people have claimed that I've said something that has not been true and we have actual recordings to prove that what they claim is not true. And, and in the future we feel very strongly that we want to make sure that people who claim things that are false we would like to be able to say no this is actually what happened and yeah. that's the reason why we record most things. But sooner or later, the point that I'm getting at is that sooner or later people will know the truth based on what happens. So there's no need to judge right in the moment. So what a lot of people do, particularly a lot of Christians, they go, we can't listen to you because the Bible says there would be a false prophet come and you're one of those. Mm -hmm. So how are they ever going to recognize their Jesus when he returns? Well, they say, oh, because he'll be like a flash of lightning from the east to the west and the sun will turn to this and the moon will turn to blood and everything and then we'll know. Yeah. And I'm saying, well, none of those things will happen. And we have scriptural evidence, even Bible based evidence, that Jesus would not engage in any of those things yeah. and that God would not engage in any of those things. So assuming that none of those things will happen, what are you going to do to determine who's the, G, the actual Jesus who claims to be Jesus. Because at the moment on the earth, there are, there are thousands of people claiming to be Jesus. Mm -hmm. Some of them have very large followings. I was watching a video the other day about a man in Russia who's 50,000 or so people following him. And uh, he can't give a direct answer about any subject uh, when he's interviewed, but lots and lots of people are following him. Yeah. And so, and he teaches that women are lesser than men and he teaches quite a number of other things that are false. Um, and, you know, sooner or later by their works you will know them, you know. And even if the works mean by their works they finish up passing and pass into the spirit world, then you'll know them. Sooner right. or later you'll know who the real Jesus is and who the real Jesus isn't. Sure. But there are hundreds of thousands of spirits who claim to be me. And there are thousands of people on earth who claim to be me. And the only way to tell who is the real me is by determining by the fruitage of the person. That's the only real way of determining. Mm. And it's the same in the first century. There were thousands of people who claimed to be the Messiah. While I was alive, there were hundreds of people who claimed to be the Messiah. While I was alive, many of them finished up getting, got, got, get, they finished up murdered by the Roman army mm -hmm. because they were leading rebellions against the Roman army claiming to be the Messiah and many people followed them. But if a person was looking at the truth and love, they would never have followed such a person. Mm. So, you know, that, that, that again was the key, by the fruitage of the person you would recognise. So you're saying really that um, with regard to the first scripture that I quoted about the false prophets and mm -hmm. how, how we know you're not a false prophet is to really examine the, your fr fruits to, to reference the other scripture. Yeah, firstly, and I have not performed any powerful works or miracles or anything else at this point in time. So, so I am not misleading people by performing powerful works and miracles. There, there are a lot of people on the earth who are misleading people by performing miracles, by the way, who are being assisted by spirits to perform such miracles mm -hmm. and uh, and they mislead a lot of people but i'm not one of them because mm -hmm. i don't do that mm. all i'm doing at this point in time is sharing truth with people and being very direct and honest and open in my statements with people yeah. which is certainly not pre performing miraculous signs or miraculous works mm -hmm. so i don't even fit into the category that the, per the of the quotation really yeah. however if i did yeah. you know because i am claiming that i am jesus and I might fit into the category then, then the key is again, you're going to have to look at my conduct and my dealings with everybody over a long period of time before you're going to know. Yeah. That's the reality. Yeah, and, and I suppose something else you touched on in your answer was um, the sense of fear that many uh, mm. Christians have surrounding this verse from Matthew and needing to be cautious. And you have actually said in your answer that there's no need to be so cautious. If you examine the fruits of a person, uh, then you'll know one way or another and there's no need yeah. to. For example, if there's a man claiming to be Jesus and you see in his dealings with women that he's basically a sexual predator, then you know that he can't be Jesus. Yeah. It's quite simple. Yeah. Jesus would not be a sexual predator, and I'm certainly not a sexual predator. And um, many people claim that I am, yeah. or they want to claim that I am, but there's no proof or evidence of yes. it. I've had one relationship in the last 10 years, and that's yeah. with you. 
Like, so, you know, how, how does that make me a sexual predator? Yeah, yeah. Every single person who ever sees me in a seminar does not ever feel any sexual energy come from me. Yeah. So, so how, you know, how the evidence is not there. Yeah. So in the first century, people made all sorts of claims. And the Bible shows this. In the, in the Bible, it says that they claimed that I was the son of a devil. Mm -hmm. They claimed that I healed people because I was the son of the devil. They claimed that uh, I was mad and crazy. And they claimed that I was some kind of deviant of some kind. Usually it was sexual or um, political in nature. And they claimed many things, all of which were false, and which any person who was close by me could see quite clearly. Mm -hmm. um, many people are doing exactly, making exactly the same claims today, exactly the same claims, yeah. all of which are also false. But they're perfectly happy to make the claims while they can get away with it and while nobody sort of and suggests differently. Yeah, them. and I suppose uh, where I was heading with my question is you're saying that Christians don't need to be afraid. They are afraid because of this scripture. Why don't they need to be afraid? Uh, you're saying we can examine the fruits, but um, there's certainly a feeling uh, in some of the Christians that I've spoken to, mm -hmm. they have a feeling that somehow they'll be tricked and perhaps... This and deceived, deceived, mm -hmm. which the scripture sort of implies mm -hmm. that they can be led astray, and you're and saying they it, don't need to be afraid of that. Is that right? Well, not really. No, no. Um, I'm not saying they need to be afraid of anything. The reality is that a person who's connected with God receives divine love and receives truth from God. They are able to determine truth in what other people say to them. Mm -hmm. So there's no need to be afraid of what other people say to them. I'm not afraid of what anybody says to me. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people make all sorts of claims to me about themselves and I'm not afraid of any of them. Mm -hmm. There's no need for a person to be afraid. There is the need for a person to be able to logically analyse and look the way through material that they receive. There's definitely a need for do, to do that. And there's also a definite need to be circumspect about what you actually follow. Yeah. You certainly do need to do that. It's no good following a course of action which would cause you to finish up murdering someone when, you know, the Bible's quite plainly against such behaviour and also your own feelings of love would be such against such behaviour. Mm -hmm. That being said, why do people go to war? Mm -hmm. They follow a government into war. Why do they do that? Because they're willing to, ser to, to dismiss the feelings of their heart based around love and they're willing to accept a prerogative to do something out of harmony with love based on some other kind of pressure that they're receiving. Mm -hmm. Now, a person who, who is in a good connection with God and themselves would never do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so even if, I was, if somebody attempted to force me to go to war, I'd rather go to jail than go to war and I'd rather be murdered myself than go to war. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Um, so I'd never go to war under any circumstance. I'd even rather see you murdered than me go to war. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have a trouble with that. Yeah. But that's how strongly I feel about the subject. There is no way a person can manipulate me into going to war, even by killing my loved ones. So that's why you're saying that people need not be afraid. Exactly. Because if they have uh, some kind of moral uh, integrity, then they can't really be swayed. Not only if they have moral integrity, if they understand the truth that comes from this relationship with God, they would understand that there's nothing to fear from death. They would understand there's nothing to fear from any of these particular activities. So why, why would you worry about them? The only worry is what can manipulate you out of a condition of love. Mm. Like, to me, that's the main concern a person should have. What is manipulating me right at this moment out of my condition of love and into in some kind of addiction and into some kind of unloving behaviour? That's the worry. That's the thing people should be concerned about mm. if they're going to be concerned about anything. Isn't that what they're <laughs> afraid of, though, with false prophets, that somehow a false prophet will manipulate them out of a condition of No, life? most of the time they're afraid of punishment. They're right. afraid of punishment from an angry God saying, you shouldn't have believed that, I'm going to kill you as a result. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing to be afraid of from God about that yeah. because God isn't an angry God who's going to punish them. So, so they don't need to be afraid of that. The only thing they need to be concerned about is what is going to take them out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. Going to war is going to take somebody out of harmony with love. Yeah. So I wouldn't do it if yeah. I was you because it's going to take you out of harmony with love. Yeah. Now, any person who preaches it from the pulpit is out of harmony with love. In fact, he's more culpable 
mm. because he's encouraging people to go to war and murder other people. Mm. So he's definitely out of harmony with love. And I'd be very concerned about that if I was sitting down in my church and the minister started talking about, you know, treating, you know, going to war and killing other people in defence of your country, I'd be getting up and walking out. And I don't know if I'd go back because, mm -hmm. to be honest, that person is trying to manipulate me out of love. Mm -hmm. You know, if a person got up and a pre if the preacher got up and started talking to me about how I should treat you, you know, as lesser than me and I sh you should be subject to me and... I should be able to boss you around and tell you what to do and you've got to take that because that's how Christ treats the congregation and all those kind of things, which is also a lie. And I would be very worried about that because that's a manipulation out of harmony with love. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I would do under those circumstances is I'd be very concerned. I'd treat the person definitely as a false prophet or a false teacher under those circumstances because it's very obvious that what he's teaching is out of harmony with love. Mm. And while it might be in harmony with the Bible, it's still out of harmony with love. Mm. And this is where I'm saying the Bible is not always in harmony with love. Yeah. And if I, treat, if I treat the Bible as only God's word, all of God's word every single time, then I'm going to be doing a lot of things that are out of harmony with love if I follow it to the letter. Mm. And that's not good for my soul and it's not good for my future progress. It's not good for my relationship with God because God doesn't care about what a written word says. No. God cares about whether you're in harmony with love or not. Yeah. That's what God cares about. Yeah. So many of these verses that talk about me uh, or worries about, you know, people like me, <laughs> you know, like people who come along and prophesy something or teach something, um, people don't need to be so afraid because, you know, and the Bible, even the Bible in, in Matthew 24 encourages fear, mm -hmm. which is out of harmony with love. Yeah. Because I said that love, pure love, throws away all fear. And in fact, if you look at another verse, like in the Bible, I think it's in 1 John, I'll just turn it up while I've got the Bible in my hand. In 1 John 4, what does it say about fear like, and, and love? It says the two of them can, cannot coexist with each other. It says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So, so here we have a verse, very true verse, one of the most true verses in the Bible. In fact, it's probably my favourite verse in the Bible. And, and here we've got a verse saying that if we truly love, we have nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Matthew 24 saying, we've got a lot to fear. Mm. Right? And I'm going, no, 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 something's wrong here. Something's inconsistent. If we truly love, we've got nothing to fear because we have the ability to clearly see what's in harmony with love and what's out of harmony with love. We have the ability to, uh, to determine the difference and we have the ability to act using our will in harmony with love every time. Yeah. That's what it means by becoming perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's what I referred to when I said, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. You cannot become at one with God without becoming perfect and, and, and perfected in love. Mm. Now, there are many verses in the Bible that do not encourage perfection in love. And those verses need to be dis discounted yeah. and removed from our life and removed from even our consideration when it comes to what we should do with our life. But there are many verses in the Bible that are very focused on love, like the one I just read in 1 John 4. Sure. And that verse, that is something you definitely need to appreciate the rest of your life, that there is no fear in love. Once you're per perfected in love, you won't be afraid of anything. You won't be afraid of a false prophet. You won't be afraid of a deceiver. You'll know when somebody's deceiving you. You'll know when somebody's being false with you. You won't be afraid of, you know, Jesus coming on the clouds to destroy everybody who doesn't believe because you know that that would never happen. Yeah. yeah because Jesus is not like that. And you know that as well mm -hmm. because you know that he's been perfected in love just like you have. Yeah. Mm. Great. Thank you. Mm.